uh, we'll have a, it looks like we're going to have a, a smaller group tonight, which I think is fine. But um, if you have other folks that you know that uh, we're thinking about coming that you want to invite, please don't hesitate to, to have them join in the conversation here. Uh, but good evening. Uh, my name is Jonathan Stewart. I'm a member of the Shenandoah Group of the Sierra Club Executive Committee. On behalf of the Shenandoah Group of the Sierra Club, I want to thank you all for joining us this evening for our discussion. If you're interested in connecting with the local Sierra Club group or looking for ways to get more involved in general, please don't hesitate to reach out to um, sc.shen.group at gmail.com. You can also connect with us on our Facebook page, which is facebook.com slash sc.shen.group. And I'm going to go ahead and toss those in the chat so people can see them. There's that stuff for you. Uh, we're going to be doing something a little bit different tonight than we have in the last year or so with our other speakers. Um, instead of a presentation with PowerPoint slides, we're going to have more of a conversation um, and explore motivation around climate action. We wanted to have this conversation after reading uh, Rebecca Solnit's piece in The Guardian. Um, and in that environmental opinion piece, she writes, the rise in public engagement with the climate crisis is hard to measure. It's definitely growing, both as an increasingly powerful movement and as a matter of individual consciousness. Yet something about the scale and danger of the crisis still seems to check challenge human psychology. Along with the fossil fuel industry, our own habits of mind are something we must overcome. So that was sort of the backdrop of what we wanted to discuss tonight. And we are joined by Dr. Wayne Teal, Dr. Ken Barron and Lizzie Emsch, who are all going to help lead us in this conversation. Uh, Lizzie is currently a senior ISAT major at JMU She's concentrating in the environment and double minoring in geographic science and environmental information systems. Lizzie is also the president of Jane Muse Environmental Management Club. Uh, she organized the Harrisonburg 2021 climate strike and is organizing many events to connect the JNU and Harrisonburg bodies together. A few of her future goals include going to graduate school for environmental law and policy and creating a nonprofit to unite global powers together in efforts to mitigate nuclear waste. Dr. Ken Barron is a professor of psychology at James Madison University and the coordinator of JMU's Motivation Research Institute. He's also a faculty fellow and member of the Motivate Lab at the University of Virginia. His research focuses on motivation and achievement in academic, sport, and work settings, and has appeared in the Journal of Personality and Social Psychology, Journal of Educational Psychology, Contemporary Educational Psychology, Educational Psychologist, Educational and Psychological Measurement, and the Journal of Applied Sports Psychology. He also regularly publishes and presents on topics related to scholarship of teaching and learning and research methodology. Throughout his career, he has received numerous teaching, research, service, and advising awards. For example, in 2012, he was named both a fellow of the American Psychological Association and one of Princeton Review's top 300 professors in America. Dr. Wayne Teal uh, lives in Kieseltown, Virginia for the last 27 years after spending nine years in Africa working on agroforestry efforts. He received his PhD from the National from the Natural Resource Development at Cornell. He received his PhD um, in Natural Resource Development, I believe, or maybe I'm misreading that, at Cornell University in 1994, specializing in agroforestry. In 1999, he and his wife, Alta, uh, moved into a self-designed straw bale house with a solar hot water system in Kieseltown, Virginia. Soon after that, he was employed as a professor of environmental science in the Integrated Science and Technology Program at JMU, where Lizzie is a student. Uh, he teaches courses on environmental issues, water quality, agricultural systems, sustainability, and African geography. Among his research interests are alternative agriculture, making and using biochar as soil amendment and, and a means of sequestering carbon, and using trees to control nutrient overload in streams. Over the last few years, few years a lot of his teaching has involved ways to address climate change. In 2013, while on sabbatical, Wayne wrote a draft of a text for his course on sustainability on sustainability titled Regenerating the Ecology of Place, which was published earlier this year. He also uses and recommends everyone read the book Drawdown in that course. Um, so welcome. I would encourage everyone to uh, use all the tools at your disposal here. The chat is open for you to use. Um, please feel free to turn on your videos because we're, again, hoping to have a little bit more of a conversation here and we'd love to see your smiling faces as part of that. Um, we, uh, yeah. So let's, I see some, some things in the chat here already, but it's private, okay. Um, so Wayne, uh, please, would you get us started? Uh, where are we, um, set the stage for climate change for us, big picture, what are we looking at globally, nationally, and locally at this point? 
Okay. Um, one of the problems with talking about climate change is there's way too much to talk about. So it is in a way difficult to narrow things down, but sometimes just looking at the headlines of the day that we are speaking on, which is today, um, is the best place to start. So about 10 minutes before I opened this um, Zoom call, a headline popped up from the Washington Post saying that 100 major international medical professionals have co-authored an article in Lance Lancet stating that, and I will quote from here, uh, climate change is set to become the defining narrative of human health, a top medical journal warned today, triggering food shortages, deadly disasters, and disease outbreaks that would dwarf the toll of the coronavirus. But aggressive efforts to curb greenhouse gas emissions from human activities could avert millions of unnecessary deaths, according to the analysis from more than 100 doctors and health experts. Okay, that is the latest headline uh, from 10 minutes ago that it came on my email message. The one before that was about the blockage by Joe Manchin of the climate proposal in the uh, Build Back Better general a bill that Biden wants everybody to sign on to. And of course, they're going to have to scale that back. So even as the medical world is warning us of impending disaster, one senator uh, in the Democratic Party and 50, of course, in the Republican Party are blocking any progress we are trying to make on climate change in the United States, which seems to be very similar to an anti-vax message. So we are addressing what motivates people in this particular conversation. And at the same time we're addressing it, we seem to be witnessing what a, an old pastor friend of mine used to call a severe hardening of the categories. This means people are setting their positions in concrete and refusing to even listen to any alternative information. And so it becomes very difficult for us in many ways to try and change. You have to be open to the possibility that you're wrong before you can change direction. And that is a tough nut to crack. I came to climate change very early in my own thinking probably back in 1986 when I first went to Cornell, when I started reading about it in, in a lot of different journals and magazines. And that was about the time that James Hansen and, and other climate scientists were starting to publish in broad detail. And then of course, in 1989, Bill, Bill McKibben uh, came out with his book, uh, The End of Nature, which has not been proven wrong in the 31 years, 32 years since it was published. Um, but it, change has been, really hard to mark. There have been a lot of people who've made changes on a personal level. Um, I know some of them, and some of them are in this organization called CAV around here, uh, Climate Action Alliance of the Valley, and, and other places, a lot of them are in Sierra Club. But it's hard to get beyond the people who've already made the categorical switch, recognizing that fossil fuels are causing the problem and trying to reduce their emissions. And that was the motivation behind my own building of a straw bale house and putting on you know, hot water panels on the roof and now solar panels uh, about six years ago. And, and we've been trying at the same time to change institutions uh, like JMU and having episodic small successes, but in terms of changing the entire ship of the institution, it's rather like the Titanic approaching an iceberg and you hope that you can turn in time, but you don't know if the captain is aware of the need to turn. Um, and so how do we, as a very small body in this particular conversation, uh, act to facilitate that change? And I am by no means an expert on that particular aspect of things, but I do try to ask my students the question and try to push them on what you can do personally, because there's a lot more that you have control of at the level where 
you live. But how do we translate that action of, say, riding an electric bicycle to work on your commute to a more broad, how does an institution change the way they use and manage energy and require their students that attend that institution to use and manage energy? Or how do we change a city like Harrisonburg or Stanton or counties like we're in to change their direction? And that's a different story and harder. And it can't be done by an individual. I think it can only be done by a collective. And so we work on it together. But the way we work and what we prioritize is something that we have to continually talk about because our priorities might change as the evidence mounts and more people like this journal the Lancet provides us with access to allies. And so what we want to do tonight is try to address these questions and see which way we can go with this conversation and see if we can be another straw that helps break the camel's back in a sense, or at least turn the camel a different direction. And they're stubborn, so we have to recognize that. Speaking of, of trying to, to turn camels in other directions, um, <laughs> Lizzie, your work right now on campus as a student um, and, and leading an environmental group on campus, I know you've been trying to have conversations and build coalitions around, you know, uh, pushing JMU to maybe adopt some carbon neutrality language and, and uh, along that line. Would you uh, like to share sort of what you guys are sort of dealing with there or um, sort of some of the work that you and, and fellow students are getting into. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so once again, I'm the president of Environmental Management Club at JNU. And uh, the day of the climate strike, we created a petition for JNU with four, um, I guess, points. Um, the first one being creating a carbon net zero plan for JNU by 2050. Um, the main impetus to this was because the governor of Virginia stated that he wanted all public um, facilities and all that to be carbon net zero and carbon neutral by 2050. Um, so after the climate strike, um, I interacted with the student body president, um, Josani Collier, and to start creating the next step forward, I guess, to this plan. Um, so that started out with communicating with um, a few different administrators here um, on campus. Um, the issues though is the campus isn't really seeing a huge amount of student interaction with environmentalism. Um, we have um, Dr. Hartman at JMU, she's the, um, I, I guess the administrator of the Stewardship and Environmental committee at JMU and she said we need only, I believe like less than 50% of JMU is interacting with any sustainability, environmental courses, all of that. And because of that, it's not really translating further up. Um, and that is what she said. She said that we need to start by educating the students to get the students more involved and then it'll just be a domino effect. We'll go up to the administrating systems and all that. So that is one of the challenges of creating a plan like this. I really initially thought it was gonna be a lot more linear, but obviously, similarly to ISA, it's a complex and dynamic system. There are a lot of stakeholders to look at, um, but our next plan is to communicate with the president of JMU and hopefully we'll get somewhere from there to talk to administration and executive leaders up there. But those are just the updates with that. Excellent. Thank you, Lizzie. Yeah, it sounds like there's some interesting, um, again, student motivation, um, administrative motivation, and, and all sorts of different pieces that are, you know, we can be talking about how, how, that, how that works for each stakeholder. But, um, oh, sorry, I, I probably just need to speak up. I have my evening voice on sometimes, so are, are you guys able to hear me if I just use my normal voice? Okay, yeah, apologies. Um, so yeah, uh, let's um, let's do some brainstorming. Um, so, uh, Ken, would you like to lead us in that, or would you like me to go ahead and, and start there, and, and we'll get into that afterwards? John, I'm happy to have you start it, and then I can help um, jump in to awesome. shape it. Okay. 
Um, so let's uh, let's start with the, some some time just to, to write um, privately for ourselves, um, or uh, start writing something in the chat without sending it because we don't want necessarily our initial thoughts to 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 push us in a certain direction. So um, let's all take a few minutes here and brainstorm out what are the the actions that we need to take uh, again, whether that's locally, nationally, globally. Um, to start turning the ship around, um, as we speak, as we said, or or turning the camel, or the other straws that we need to break the, the proverbial camel's back. Um, what are the things that we need to do? Uh, so let's go ahead and, and just on our own start writing down some ideas, or again uh, start typing things in the chat, but don't send them just yet. And we'll we'll give a, a couple of minutes, and then we can all send them together and see what pops up in the chat. Uh, so yeah, at 718, let's just do it quickly. Let's take about two minutes to do some, some quick brainstorming and start there. Jonathan, you're on mute if you're... Of course I am. <laughs> uh, so yeah, so that's, we're at a couple of minutes here. So let's all go ahead and, and put whatever we had in the chat there and just send it through and see what we have popping up. Thanks for that history there, Lynn. Just the beginning. Yeah. But the beginning. Well, actually, the beginning was recycling in 1972 in Hawaii. We see where that gets us. Ah, sorry. <laughs> 
All right, we got some great stuff in here. I'm just because, you know, people that are watching this later might not be able to see things. We kind of read through some of these here a little bit. Um, yeah, getting political leaders to have a vested interest. Um, right, getting leaders, politicians, administrators, and NGOs um, need to hear priorities on climate change, need to name the priorities for those folks. Um, more solar and wind farms, carbon neutral plans, locally getting ready for electric vehicle deployments, passing critical legislation to stop bad climate behavior and promote better climate behaviors. Um, the, a tree canopy program locally. Uh, voting at local national elections, signing petitions, calling representatives, eating sustainably local food, less meat, recycling and compost. Uh, less consumption in general, lasting goods that are sustainably sourced, less resource use in transportation, living closer to work and walking, cycling, public transport, local land use, um, more friendly, higher density living, bike lanes, less highway oriented, et cetera, less highway or oriented, et cetera. Set a price on carbon. Um, great, yeah, so we have some, some really interesting um, and, and good suggestions in here. Uh, again, things that that we may have seen in, in various places and various discussions coming up with, with um, and any kind of conversation around climate change. But so from here, um, I think we'd like to, to start deciphering some of this and, and having a conversation around motivation. Um, so Ken, uh, could you take it away on, on sort of explaining to us what your motivational uh, equation is that you all have been using and, and how we can start to decipher some of this? Sure, happy to, Jonathan. Actually, I'm really intrigued how you frame this because what's in the chat are proposed solutions, which all sound wonderful, right? Then the question is, well, what's either helping our motivation to do these or what's inhibiting our motivation to do wonderful solutions, which Lynn, it sounds like you've been pitching for a while around here, yes? I'm an old lady here. Yeah, um, I do have a couple quick Visual aids, AKA a PowerPoint. So Jonathan, do I have share screen capability? I do, thank you, sir. Um, and I wanna, I'm gonna make an elevator pitch here. So I'm gonna be able to do this as we often go in elevators very quickly um, to talk through. Is there this motivational, when we think about motivational issues, motivational problems, is there a simple formula first and foremost to understand the problem? Like what could help it, what could hurt it? Uh, but then more importantly, if we understand what the problem is, how do we improve it? So right now we have a lot of solutions proposed on what to change to make it better. But what's, what's really the human problem preventing us from doing that? Um, so here's my pitch. If there are many, many theories of motivation that uh, humans have done a lot to research and think through over time in different domains, whether in educational arenas, business arenas, sport arenas, or in this case, I know less particularly about studying it in a climate context, but I'm really fascinated by that because as trained as a psychologist, we could play in any environment. Um, but my pitch would be if we only had one floor to hang out, could I give you that pitch that quickly? If we could have two floors, four floors, five floors, whatever. The point is I'd make it really quick. So here's what I'm gonna do. It's challenging. There are textbook authors that get really frustrated with us because we have too many theories. We have too many ideas of what motivates people. Uh, we have confusing terminology. We have a lot of academic jargon. We're not gonna do 48 plus or minus eight theories by any means, because I wanna give you this quick elevator pitch. So Jonathan mentioned a formula. And the great thing about formula, is does it give us a roadmap? So the formula simply is four letters, M equals E plus V minus C. I could put on a post-it note, I could write it on a cocktail napkin, and I certainly could maybe have you imagine that in that elevator. But let's break it down. I'm gonna let you guess what M is. And of course, it's gonna be motivation. So humans in general, when are we optimally motivated? Well, we need the first thing, we need E. What is E? We're gonna honor a term from, again, research done, and the term is expectancy, but it's a little bit jargony. So I wanna keep it in everyday language too. This is your expectancy that you would succeed or fail at something. So it's really all about, can you do the task? So partly framing the, the solutions you have 
are, are they potentially e problems that people don't think they could do those things? Thus, that could be the problem why we haven't enacted those changes yet. We could have though all the e in the world, that's only one part, we still may not appear motivated or we're not changing because we don't have V. What is V? V's value. So not only do you want the can do motivation, can I actually do that thing? I got to have the, the value, the one to motivation. This historically has been known as expectancy value theories. So if I only could give you one theory, this is the theory that I finally got anchored into after being a student for 25 years of having a parsimonious way to encapsulate lots of different concepts and that have been debated in research over time. But interestingly, <clears throat> when we have hung out with people and been doing more work, whether again in a classroom or in a sport field or in a business context, there was one letter missing that still wasn't explaining. Because it could be that we do think we can do it, those changes you proposed. We value them, we wanna do them, but there was still something getting in the way. Notice the math here, it's minus C. So what are Cs? Cs are costs. Everything we do, we have limited time, energy, and resources as a human. We're talking about the environment, we do too, right? So if the costs of that behavior are too high, because they take too much time, they take too much energy, they take too many resources for us to enact, it doesn't matter what our E and V could be. It could be then leading us to be inactive or demotivated. So playing off a stoplight metaphor, if, we're, if I was having a chance, which is, it would be great tonight, I haven't done this formula in this context before, but I'd be wanting to talk about, well, how can we turn on E and V issues for people? Because again, if I'm redesigning a classroom, redesigning a, an, you know, sport context with coaches or a business context with a, an employer, I'm thinking, what are you doing with your those groups to make them feel that they can do it, the E and the V? But similarly, what do we have to stop? We got to be really mindful of costs. Although you are making me think of a nice little plot twist. I think, Josh, you put in a really good thing. I want to bring up that example that you brought up too as a solution. Um, Typically, we think about designing an optimal motivating environment for work or sport or play or education. We're thinking about removing that, okay? Why is my elevator pitch simple? Is because I don't know if any of these other terms or things in your careers you've seen or heard. I could argue that we can put all of them under one of these three letters, that we've got different ways to think about motivation. We've got different people that focus on a specific lens, but I'm gonna say at the end of the day, they're about can-do motivation. We gotta turn that lever on. They're about one-to motivation. It could be turn the, the value lever on, or more recently, the appreciation of these additional costs that are gonna prevent us, that we can connect to. And so we're doing a lot of writing now to try to honor having a fuller framework or more tools in our motivational toolbox to know how to invoke change. I've got one last plot. So we now have rebranded expectancy value cost theory to honor those three letters. <clears throat> so let me stop and pause there to see if that uh, anybody would like to offer a follow-up question if we're hanging out in the elevator together that I'm pitching this formula. Does this seem to make sense? Can do, want to, and you've got the resources, your costs are low versus you have too many costs, you're not gonna do it. Does fear fit underneath? In, in any of those uh, categories? Lynn, absolutely could be. It depends how you define fear. So is it, can you play that out, fear of, because it depends on who. Um, we are, are trying to uh, decide uh, on a book to supply to schools and student groups and, and libraries. Uh, we've, we've done, the CAB I'm talking about has done this before. And this is a book for kids reading, kids eight to 12. Right. The assumption would be that they would read it with their parents. And it's the frightening stuff, little step by little step, that is leading to what is the, at the end of this whole business of climate change, uh, which is extinction of lots of stuff, including us, maybe not all of us. But uh, is that underneath one of these things, one of these theories uh, or more? Um, is that something that we just have to totally give up on? Because actually I've stayed away from that so far, but uh, it's looking So back. what's interesting, and I love it, because fear, again, these aren't objective, by the way. These are subjective psychological states. So it's your interpretation of your situation that I feel I can do it. It's your interpretation, I value it. It's your interpretation if you have high costs, because 
yes, we could say maybe we operationalize on some level, we think you'd have higher load, but at the end of the day, it's how you operationalize it. So why am I saying that, Lynn? If you have a lot of fear and you become overwhelmed by fear and you start to have anxiety because of that fear, that is a very costly situation for a human being because that can shut us down. We can become helpless and hopeless. So the parallel, again, I've not looked at it in a climate context, but the parallel would be health messaging. Do you scare people into to, to adopt better health practices, which often can fail because then people just want to shut the message out. And we now know we've got how many TV stations to look at, how many uh, uh, radio stations that we can just not hear that. We have selective exposure. We, we will not attend to that message. So it could be that you do a fear appeal thinking that it'll shake us up and scare us into action, but it could backfire. There could be unintended consequences. Definitely that could happen, sure. I would predict. Well, that's what I'm afraid of is the unintended con consequences. But having tried many, many <laughs> other ways over the years of helping people to understand what is going on and what could be coming if we don't change, uh, I've started to think, especially with looking at this book, which has all the information simply said, including positive things like what you can do as a kid, what people are doing and their good, good ideas and, and innovative for uh, passing information and changing habits and so forth. But I, I started, I, at first I thought, well, this is gonna scare kids. And then the parents are gonna say, we're not reading this, but maybe the kids being scared or inquisitive will make their parents actually act. And I gotta go pretty soon, so. Uh, um, but I will watch the, uh, the recording and I, I'm, I'm, I'm just really interested in knowing how to talk to people who don't wanna listen to you or, or trying to overcome the, what I see is the main barrier, which is the privilege and being used to having all this that we want as, you know, from food to um, cars, and it's not true around the world, but all of the things that we want are the things that are causing climate change. And to be able to get people to understand that eh, it's kind of reasonable to back off a little bit on our appetites, but I don't know how to do it. I don't know how to do it. And that's what I want from you, please. So Lynn, interestingly, in knowing they've got to go, it sounds like we are motivated to do those other things because we value them a lot. And it could be we value driving our own personal car because that gives us autonomy to go where I want, when I want, as opposed to waiting for public transportation, which may or may not exist well. So it could be that we have a, an unbalanced equation here because you're, if we want to have better practices, we have to then have other consequences to devalue those things and reprioritize and revalue. Um, one, you know, again, takeaway, Jonathan, is that there are literatures to look at. And if you're, if it's the vehicle of trying to persuade people, that is, I'm a social psychologist by training, persuasion. How do you actually persuade somebody who has a counter opinion to you? And how do you then have discussions? And often it is get to put people into uncomfortable situations where they have to take the opposing side and get them to defend it much like in a debate. And then do they start to realize, oh, these positions do make more sense. So again, presenting both sides and letting that happen. So there could be some other avenues when you think about working with kids and hosting debates and basically let the magic happen because saying is believing. If you get somebody that doesn't believe something to start to actually get evidence for it, um, they can start to change their attitudes. So attitude change persuasion definitely sounds like a thing to play off of. Um, What's interesting, this is a framework. So one, I'd wanna say like, which, just to throw out for fun, do you think one of these letters is the problem? Is it a, a can-do problem, an E problem that people can't change their behaviors to be climate uh, positive? Is it they don't value it? Or is it the cost to try to do these behaviors is too high, too difficult, takes too much time? You think it's just one or do you think they're multiple at play? And I would guess that there's multiple at play depending on the context you're looking at, right? So it's certain organizations trying to do things, right? Like it's entirely possible that one of the big um, pushbacks, for example, at JMU adopting some, some broader policy or doing X, Y, or Z to, to be a part of, of the change is cost, 
right? It literally could be a numbers game for him at some point, right? You don't want to raise tuition to be able to do this, this, and this. Um, the cost is too high. Um, and then I think for, for individuals, I think like, like Lynn said, maybe some of the fear aspects, like for some people that could be motivating and saying like, that's going to cause me to value this more because I'm afraid of what could happen. Um, or the fear makes you sort of like, there's, there's no hope, right? That the hopelessness, and then you, you expect that you can't do anything. So why would you try? Um, so I think it's sort of everything for, for different people and, and different contexts, but. Lynn, how much time do you have? I'm just curious. None. I'm, um, None. Let me tell you what we've done next. So literally, this is a laminated motivational menu that okay. we have piloted with teachers um, around the country to try to say, okay, do you now have a framework? You don't have to know 48 plus or minus eight theories, but again, walking in your classroom is an e prom, B prom, or C prom. Then if you say, I think it's an e prom, you go order off the e menu. Like what strategies could you try to help promote the students' belief that they could do it? What strategies could you try to help promote their value? What things could you take away to promote their costs? So I have examples of, um, let me just scroll down to, so this is the menu, the front page. And, you know, again, we wrote it, we made it for students, but the whole point is motivation. These are theories about humans. I could fill in the blank. How do we do this to motivate humans? Um, it's a menu, but I'm gonna zoom in on, uh, two things. I'm going to go to value. One way to make me start to learn something, like to do, first off, it would be wonderful if everybody had intrinsic interest or value to want to adopt climate positive practices, right? But then we've won. They would all be here tonight, right? You're saying it's frustrating. We get the same side. So seemingly this isn't an intrinsic value that you're going to prioritize. But Intrinsic value comes through experiences. The way to, to catch or start intrinsic value or getting me interested in something is to do this V2 strategy. You catch the situational interest. Here's where fear could work. You don't have to have it be positive. You have to make me pay attention. Get me for 15 minutes to start focusing on. But what you need to do, what really helps with fear appeals, you got to give a solution. You got to give a pathway. If people don't see a pathway, they'll start to disengage from just the fear appeal or the scary stuff. So they'll want to look at the car rack potentially, but yet they can't stay looking at that car rack. So it could be, again, I'd want you to pilot test this with a couple people. Don't roll it out to an entire school, by the way. See if that could help catch interest. And it could be that certain situations, certain kids, certain schools, levels, it could work. So that's the point that you could use fear to catch me, like make me pay attention to something. So it could have value. But I want to go to the cost menu because there are lots of costs. And we prime costs sounds financial, but costs can be psychological, it can be time, it can be all kinds of things. So C4, if you have negative psychological reactions, humans do not like uncertainty. We don't like that. So when we fear stuff, it makes us uncertain, and so we will avoid. And that would be the downside to that strategy, that it could be have that unintended consequence. Again, scaffolded, it might really work to catch interest, especially if you pivot it to positive things that I could do. What's something we could do tomorrow, next week, to start to see some hope? Um, another field of psych, historically psych has been focused on psychopathology, which is depression, hopelessness. But there's been a modern push in the 2000s for positive psych of what makes us hopeful. This is a field and an area, right? We need to be hopeful to build me to want to approach the problem potentially. Um, so I just wanted to play that out. So I love Lynn hearing what the idea is and then thinking about the psychology of that idea, how that could play out is really fascinating. I'd love, if you wanted to follow up, please reach out to me. I'd be happy to follow I'm up. I'm going to do that. I, I, I do have to leave because one of my motivations to keep out this is going to my book group. And so I'm going to do it now. And um, Guess what? That's C3. For this. So C3, which could be your other dilemma, loss of valued alternatives. It's a cost because to be here, you're giving up something else. But now you're like, I'm going to go to that thing, but that's high cost to be in. Just like you want to be better, but you got to give up the carbon footprint of your car, your house, whatever that you also like too. Uh, I'm, I'm not worried about myself being afraid. I, I, and the fear thing that I'm talking about really is parents being afraid of what's going to happen for their kids once they finally get it. And I'm going to just leave with one thing that that got in the way with me and some of my neighbors and some of the people that I know around here. And when I started talking about 
climate change. This was at least 10 years ago, and I still hear this answer. God wouldn't do that to us. And it's just, I can't, I can't face that anymore. I, so I want the kids to, little kids, to say, this looks terrible, mommy and daddy. We can do this. We can do this. And that's, so I'll send you, I, I will listen to this. And I'm sorry, I'm taking too much, so much time up, but I will listen to this tomorrow. And um, I will also send you the title of this one book that I'm looking at, because it has every issue in it, simplified, but complicated enough with consequences and with suggestions for what you can do in a positive way. And, um, and uh, would seemingly want to. So, yeah, it's, it's easy for us to look away from things that are getting close. Leaves aren't falling off the trees right now, are they? All right. Thank you very much for this, Jonathan. Yeah, thanks for joining, Lynn. Yeah, yeah. Well, um, we'll make sure we get you the recording soon here. Thank you. Night, night. Here's the observation. I want to come back to what Josh posted in the chat. Um, we could use this to, again, to build a better environment that promotes E and B and takes away C. But interestingly, we could use this to our advantage. We could make the behaviors we want to stop more costly. So then they become demotivated. And what is a great way to do that? That's, that's simple strategy. Charge me for my plastic bags when I go through the checkout counter. Well, that finally means that I will buy the recycled bags, or I'll bring my own bags, or I'll bring, you know, a uh, laundry basket, whatever. The simple thing. So then that's really interesting. There's a great story just thinking about changing your behavior as a human that I love to tell that I, I heard um, shared. Somebody bought a, car, a guitar, wanted to learn how to play the guitar, but had a, it was a really nice guitar, a really nice case put in the closet. But he realized putting in the closet in the nice case, that was just a subtle next one or two additional steps out of sight, out of mind. He wasn't playing his guitar. So he found this little guitar stand at a garage sale, plopped it right in the middle of his living room so he could see his guitar all the time. So he took the cost away from the behavior he wanted to do and it made it less costly. But the other thing he shared, he still wasn't playing it because it was easy, too easy to come home, sit down on the couch and that remote control to plus, press play and go to any channel he wanted on a TV. So he's like, that's bad. So I want to read more, I want to play my guitar. So he decided to make it costly to not have a simple remote to press play and get sucked into TV. He took the batteries out of his remote, put them in two rooms over in his kitchen so that when he sat down on the couch, he would literally have to get up, go over two rooms to now do a very costly behavior. Or he could just grab his guitar or grab his reading. So the other interesting thing about using this formula could be we need to make a lot of other behaviors that we've come to accustomed to like costly and make these other things less costly. So we could use the formula two ways. But I wanna throw it out. I'm really curious, again, any of those solutions you pitched and you're trying to change human behavior to do them, do you think it's an E problem, a B problem, or a C problem to make those things happen if you're really excited by those solutions? All right, let me, let me jump in because it's, this, this way of framing it is really helpful for me. Um, and I like it because I can even look back on my own uh, motivation for getting an electric bike. Obviously the electric bike aspect of it the thing that prevented me from riding a bike to school before was the cost, energy cost of riding it with my own pedal power because I always ended up really sweaty and needing to take a shower or rinse off when I got to, got to work. So the cost went down when electric bikes price level was there. And so for me, then I was enthusiastic and I valued that. That was, I think, B1 on your list. It was the first, first value. Um, but when I talk to other people about riding a bike, the C that they refer to, sometimes for students, it's cost because they're obviously paying tuition. But for other uh, people like myself that, that have an income, it's not the cost of the bike, it's safety. And so you have to go to the cost that is their safety level and address where the safety is. 
And the problem with Harrisonburg, and in fact, all the cities that I've seen in the US so far, and I haven't been to Boulder or other bicycle friendly cities, is that we have ignored the lesson of Amsterdam and Copenhagen, which is the main safety issue is not on the straight of way, it's at the intersections. And that's where the bike lanes all end. You don't have safety in the intersections and that's what scares people. And so we're not following the cost that makes people stop. Students stop at sea because they're less, they have less concern for the safety aspect. They're more willing to take risks. Otherwise they wouldn't ride those scooters around campus without a helmet. But, but, um, but the other, the safety side, I think is really the key issue. And so there's probably things like that in every strategy that we want to come up with that we should think of these kinds of things. So maybe you'll uh, Wayne, speak in my Wayne, sustainability I love, class about this. <laughs> yeah, I, I love the example because again, you said biking the old fashioned way, you were sweaty. So that has negative psychological, physical reactions to say a C5, because now you're sweaty at work, but maybe we have showers to put that out so we could address that. But then that creates a lot of C1 because to bike and shower, you have to get to up earlier, get to work, depending on how far away you live. So these quickly can multiply. And then you're right, that negative psychological reaction, that's not a good place to be. So it could be a safety issue. I love that example that, again, same thing we think about our, our students walking in a classroom, they don't feel safe because of their identity issues not being re reinforced or acknowledged. Powerful thing to think about. It's not, again, cost is just a historical term. It's not just about money, that's for sure. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it is for some people, but generally it's, it's other issues that get in the way that you have to, uh, you can only find out about by asking questions in conversations, which is why Catherine Hayhoe, when she talks about talking to people about climate change, says the first thing you have to do is just talk. Make sure the subject comes up. You have to be the one to break the ice to bring climate change into a conversation. And then once you talk, you can begin to find the kinds of things that you're looking at. What are the costs or the values that would uh, bring people into the actions that you want to see happen? Let's see. What's really interesting. <laughs> yeah, what's really interesting is, again, a unique social problem to solve. Like now, cost could be a good thing to make certain things more costly. But I actually want to play out some values too, because again, these, and I should say, what got on this menu? These are research, empirically research supported, either through experimental research designs to get cause and effect, or really good correlational. If you do this, it'll be more likely to be predictive or relate to the, uh, the outcomes we want. Again, we'd love it if everybody had V1. They had intrinsic value to do this. Most people in this room probably have it. That's why they're here but we can start it with V2. So that would be the education point that Lynn was trying to say, like, what can we do to launch introducing the top, like you're saying, talk the information and to then hook me. If you maintain my situational interest, I'm gonna become uh, invested in it over time. But again, I teach coursework that a lot of students in my major don't think they're ever gonna love. And at the end of the day, I'm just trying to get them to have a V3. Are they gonna see this is really important? This is really relevant, this is really useful. So the point is, if we don't stop, there is no planet Earth left, right? That there are dire consequences and how we reframe it. But then, Lindsay, I'm really intrigued by, again, we're getting so many, we have a lot of social crises going on around identity issues on top of political, on top of environmental, et cetera, and health. But identity value, do people identify with this topic? And so you said at JMU, how large is the environmental club? You might be on mute or your microphone's off, Lizzie. We don't hear you. Huh. I'll keep going for time's sake, Jonathan. Lizzie, if you can jump in, that's great. Um, but here's where I might have hope too for us. V5, current generation of students, when we ask them, why are you going into college? What, what, what's the priority? My generation often would say to get a better social strata for money. And a lot of us think it's about money. 
A lot of students don't pick that as the reason that they want to be here. So that's not their V. Their V often is, I wanna do something meaningful. I wanna do something pro-social and that has some communal impact. So we could be now in a place where we have a next generation that is gonna see this problem differently than our generation and the generation above me. Um, so I wanna play off of that too. Can you, Lizzie, did you solve it? Yes, can y'all yeah. hear me? I don't know, yeah. I've never had that happen to me. So it just stopped <laughs> working halfway, it's fine. Anyways, um, yeah, we had around 200 people sign up, but in actuality, 20, 10 people come to the meetings. Um, when I, um, you know, got the climate strike going, at least around 50 people came for the 2021 one versus in 2019, it was like over a few hundred. So um, there's people that, you know, they want to start it, but it's like, it's, it's with this equation, you know, <laughs> it's like a lot of things saying, but not a lot of them doing. And um, it's just the value. Yeah. It's, it's difficult. <laughs> Which again is telling, and you know, we have over 20,000 students here. So to hear 200 yeah. down to 20, we have a lot of work to do, right? To, to, make this, to make this something to catch me, to value it. But here's the other thing you are now nicely making me want to share. When I'm talking to people creating more pro uh, promotion folks environments, teachers, coaches, bosses, I often go to V11 and I say, V11, you're playing with fire. We often go there, that's what we were trained to reward a behavior or to give a punishment to behavior. And that's too easy to go because often it gets compliance, it'll get quantity, but not high quality or creativity. But interestingly, I will say, I will go V11. I don't wanna go V11 on my students unless you make me. And what I mean by that is if there's no motivation in the system at all, then go V11. You also mentioned in the chat policy. So partly, if you wanna change human behavior, like we're not wise enough to find our own way to, into this motivational equation, can we change policy to make it happen? So Lizzie, I'm really glad I heard you say, what did you wanna do for your career that Jonathan told us? Go into environmental law and policy, because this could be that we're not gonna get enough movement yet if it's only 1% or half a percent that are going to these events, unless we change policy. So it could be that V11 is what we need to do. We need to reward or punish bad or uh, you know bad things for the environment. Hey Ken, I'm just curious. Uh, where were kind of the feeling of like being a part of something larger than yourself and in the value sources you have? Yeah, totally. One V5 pro social, and also again. Um, yeah, I would put it there the most. It depends on how, like identity value, it's like, what do you think is important in life? And if that is like a movement you want to be part of, or if you have identified like environmentalism is a, an identity that's core to your being, again, you that's a good day. You get to hit that. You get to experience that. So it could be could be there, Ken. Nice to see another. Can you go by Kenneth? Uh, I go by KC. I should go ahead and KC. change that. Okay. <laughs> I was, a, I'm a formally, I'm a, I'm a legal aid Kenneth too. But uh, again, we were, I'll just finish this. These are East sort of strategies. Same thing about how do you build somebody's belief they can do it. And again, if you're trying to get more people wooed, uh, E3, like they don't have to be successful personally, but can we see indirect? So where are their wins? We, we, just, we had a chance to meet earlier and I was just sharing some other a university. I got to watch my kids go on a, a college tour where they really are doing a great job that JMU isn't there yet. And uh, where can we then have more role models to help us say, oh, we can, they can do it, we can do that, that allow us to, to have that kind of progress. But again, it depends what you think the issue is. I would say we flip to a different part of this motivational menu to look for the research supported strategies that help unlock that letter, mm -hmm. if that makes sense. John, let me turn it over back to you though, uh, to take us where you wanna go from here. No, I think I'm, I could sit here and have this conversation for the next handful of hours. Um, I know we want to uh, typically keep these to an hour for folks, but um, yeah, did, does anyone have any other questions or comments or maybe some other examples that you put in that we want to try to sort of briefly analyze and, and think through? Uh, um, I was just kind of thinking along the lines of something that's relatively low cost, that there's a lot of value involved there. 
uh, just changing different kinds of eating habits. Because I feel like a lot of the kind of things that we look at the climate change are so large scale and so far away in distance and in time that you're like, well, I can't possibly do anything. And I think you're going to make at least three decisions a day. And if you're me, a lot more than three <laughs> decisions a day about what you're going to be eating. Uh, so I think there's a lot that's involved with that. And I think there's also a lot involved with that that can go into different places. So eating less meat, uh, getting food that's more sustainably sourced, or just more simple things like meal planning and making sure that you're using the stuff that's in your fridge and it's just not going to the trash at the end of the week. Uh, <laughs> or composting uh, uh, whatever it is you need to compost to be in with that. So that kind of thing can be done very directly, uh, doesn't involve a huge like corporation necessarily, can be a personal decision that you're making that can have a lot of synergies. Synergies in terms of like uh, costs, for example, like mm -hmm. financial or other things. I mean, Casey, I really love what you said. Start with a lower cost behavior to then build some sense of efficacy. Oh, we can change something to give me hope. Again, emotionality, we can think cognitively, we can think behaviorally, we can think emotions. And creating positive emotions often make us approach. And when we, that's the thing about when Lynn was saying fear, sometimes it's going to make us avoid and just mm, and, and, and not go there. Uh, so I really like that, that, that idea. The other interesting thing, Wayne told me a little bit of story about where his house is, but the thing I'm curious too, Lizzie, I don't know this on Jamie. We often talk about improvement. We need to do a lot of improvement, right? You can't improve what you don't measure. There's a nice little mantra. Mm -hmm. So Wayne, you probably have wonderful improvement measures that have guided how well your practices have led you because you shared with us how you stopped paying bills or you're maybe, are you giving back energy to the grid now? Well, a little bit because my daughter moved in the house. So there's four people living there now. And so we're paying down on the surplus that we had with, with uh, uh, Dominion, but I still haven't paid an electric bill since uh, February of 2016 after we put in the 4.4 kilowatts of, of solar, um, which is about a third of what a house our size should require, um, according to Dominion. So they let us do it. But the reason is I was motivated when we built the house to build a house that had very low energy cost. Um, because I'd been reading about climate change since 1986 and had been involved in the environmental movement since Earth Day, the first one in 1972. And so uh, I'm old, but, but uh, with that kind of motivation, I, I was able to put that together. And, and so it's, it's paid off and, you know, I, I like to play with numbers. And that's that's gives me feedback that that's the positive thing. You had feedback in your in your list, which is a really important kind of thing. So I play with numbers. I've put ten thousand miles on my electric bike since I bought it. Most of that is commuting. So I just ran the numbers. If I were to have ridden a Prius the same distance, it would have been four thousand four hundred and fifty six pounds of carbon dioxide that it would have emitted into the atmosphere with a Prius. If I had been driving a twenty five mile per hour car, it would have been double that. And so that to me is a so kind of a sign of success. And it gives me some motivation to just, hey, keep, keep doing this. I would imagine, and Josh, I'm gonna throw you under the bus here. If you planted 20 trees in Harrisonburg, your motivation might go up to plant more. And, and you know, just that seeing a success then builds the success to going somewhere else. 100%, and, and that's actually, again, from a, a motivational drive, we don't have to achieve the goal yet, but do we see progress towards the goal? Because again, builds our hope, but then we get positive feedback and, and getting the endorphin high that you're gonna get from that kind of win. Um, but I'm intrigued because, you know, like a lot of us have really interesting personal devices, a Garmin watch that I can measure all kinds of stuff about me. Uh, it's not measuring my carbon footprint though, right? It's measuring mm -hmm. my steps. But what if we did, and I don't know if there's a residence hall yet on campus that is measuring outputs and that is like a residence hall challenge across the campus, or even Casey, your point about food waste, like what's the food waste in our dining halls, for example? 
can we start to get measurable impacts uh, on our wins and have early wins to get excited and get this collective? Because the other thing on my list was enthusiasm. When we see role models that inspire us, that transform us, because we want that leader like to, we all follow you, but can we get that kind of passionate enthusiasm to hook more people? Because I think it's that contagious energy that, okay, we're in a movement now. And I think Wayne, you said you personally, we need to move from personal change to some kind of collective efficacy, collective change. And wouldn't that be exciting if we could rebrand some things? And again, just going back to JMU examples on our campus to do that. Mm -hmm. Thank you all so much for, for a really incredible conversation. I think this is a lot of food for thought for people to continue. Like I'm already excited about like the email that I want to send to Lizzie and start like thinking like, can we be using some of this to think about the conversations that you're going to be having with administrators in the coming months or um, with other students? Um, so yeah, um, thank you all so much. Um, again, please don't hesitate to, to reach out to folks if you have questions, hit us up on Facebook or in our email, we can get you connected. Um, and yeah, have a wonderful evening and um, we'll see you at the next event. Okay. Thank you.